Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 481, A Moralizing Duchess. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello! I hope you are well and not buried under 8 to 16 inches of snow. Twice. In one week. With another storm coming. Ah! I have no, I have no explanation except bombogenesis, the word that everybody suddenly knows on the East Coast. Yay. So we, we are buried under snow, but this time our power didn't go out and I should be able to get room with a view out this week and life is therefore good and happy and fair and pleasant. And the kids are in school today. Hallelujah. So I have craftiness this week that is again, of the cleaning variety. But, you know, with so much of the country heading towards spring, (laughs) and therefore spring cleaning, I thought, actually, this is probably not such a bad topic. I have gotten lots of emails. There's some overlappingness in the emails that that I've been getting, but a couple of unique ones that I thought I would share, or the ones that came in first saying similar things. And all of this information is in the show notes at craftlet.com slash 481. So the first one is a New York Times article on cleaning, which is the one that I couldn't find last week when I was building the show notes, but it has all the everything on ketchup and vinegar and all of the details on how all of those work as cleaners. So it kind of goes along with what Tara had to say. And then a website, simplygoodstuff.com, which I think I did link to last week, that has both products and like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cleaning tips that don't require the purchase of their products, which is what I appreciated. And then Lex wrote in with an interesting option that I have not exploited yet because of the snow. Today, I am actually going to go to the pet store and pick up some pet aquarium. So like lizard, turtle kind of aquarium, lime scale remover. Because it has to be safe, right? If you're going to use it in an aquarium where there is a small animal, you want to make sure that that is not going to toxify their environment. So this is an interesting option for a shower without much in the way of ventilation. So my fingers are crossed on that one. I thought that was genius. So thank you, Lex. And then Yvonne of Lavender Sheep, she wrote in and several other people did as well. She wrote in with a slightly different recipe. Now, I have done, and I've already tried, a two-to-one mixture of this. Two parts white vinegar to one part Dawn. So like one cup of white vinegar to a half cup of Dawn. Regular old, it cuts the grease, Dawn dishwashing liquid. Not dishwasher detergent. They are different things. One of the tricks for this mixture is that you have to heat the white vinegar up in a microwave for like a minute, get it nice and toasty hot, and then mix it with the Dawn as Yvonne said it's easier to do this in a spray bottle. So if you have an empty spray bottle around, pour in your Dawn, heat up your vinegar, pour that in, shake that sucker up, and then go spray it on. Now she says her husband would mix this up at the one-to-one ratio and then spray everywhere, leave it for 30 minutes, then come back and scrub it and rinse. I tried that with the two-to-one ratio. I will now try this with a one-to-one ratio and see if I have any more luck with that. I am including a photograph that I took. It's very hard to try and get a photograph of hard water stains on glass because it's glass and all and therefore transparent and getting the camera lens to focus on the actual glass instead of what's behind it was a little tricky, but I figured it out and I have a picture for you. And you need to know that all of the products that you can see blurry in the background, those are all of the things that I've used multiple times on both sides of this glass shower door, and you will see what is still there. 
And that should give you an idea why I'm really worried that this might actually just be etched in at this point. In which case, maybe I should just get some glass etching stuff and make it, you know, pretty. <sighs> I have no idea. Anyway, you can take a look at the pictures, see what you think, send in any more information or ideas you have, and we'll see what happens. And I'll let you know what the Limescale stuff does from the pet store. I'm excited about that. I have another question for you. This one is a different kind of cleansing, I think. I have been seeing in various places, Tucson being the first time I noticed it, but since then I've been noticing it everywhere. Turmeric? Okay, there's a thing that I've seen now in restaurants and coffee shops. Golden milk, which is a turmeric and other spices paste that you mix with milk. You can heat it up, I guess, or have it cold, I imagine, if you can dissolve the turmeric stuff in it. What? Why? Where? How? Does it taste good? Is it anything like chai? I like chai, but somehow the turmeric thing is just totally creeping me out. And I <laughs> and every time I try and find information on it, I find these vaguely kind of my initial reaction is, wow, that's so Southern California. <laughs> They're kind of along the lines of, you know, so like if you want to feel like really good about like yourself and everything. And I keep thinking that cannot be the reason why. Some of the people who I see drinking the turmeric stuff are drinking the turmeric stuff. There has to be more to it than just like, you know, it's really relaxing and stuff. So let me know if you know anything about the turmeric craze that's going on. I can only imagine that the companies that actually import turmeric must be thrilled to have all of this happening. Perhaps they're behind this. I don't know. But if you have news, please call or write. You can call 1-206-350-1642 and share your thoughts, or you can go to craftlit.com and use the sidebar little button doohickey for our SpeakPipe account. Or you can go to speakpipe.com slash craftlit, and that way you can record. I think it's only 90 seconds at a time, but at least you can record from anywhere in the world for free. And that comes to me in an email, and then I can put it on the show so everybody can hear what you have to say. Yay! Okay, we have a couple of calls before our chapter episode and then a call after. For our before the chapter call, our first is from Tara. And Tara has some comments about the line from a previous chapter when Marilla asks Anne if the women who took care of her before were good to her. I haven't gone back to listen to what I said, but I'm very, very hoping that I didn't misspeak or say anything desperately stupid because I absolutely agree with, understand, and in fact had thought along similar lines as what Tara has to say. It's just clear to me that she is saying it better than I did. So if I managed to at all. So here is Tara. Hi, Heather. Tara here. I just finished listening to chapters five, six, and seven about uh, Anne and Green Gables, and I had a thought about how Anne answered the question, were they good to you or were you treated well? She answered sort of the same way I answered whenever people ask me, well, what, the, what was it like growing up with your half-sister and your mom and your stepdad? Well, for the longest time, I didn't see him as a stepdad, and even now I don't call him stepdad, he's just dad. But being 30 and looking back on my growing up, I was a step child. I didn't always get what I wanted, when I wanted, if I wanted. I didn't get the best. I was the oldest, so I was expected to act better. I was gravely or deeply reprimanded when I did misbehave. Whilst my younger sibling got off with criminal murder on most cases, and in the meanwhile, I would do something silly or foolish and be sentenced to life in a state pen by my 15-year-old eyes. So her answer was, well, I'm not going to say no because they did the best they could given the circumstances. But it could have been better. It's one of those things. You're treated 
like an outsider, but it's not so much like a rabid dog, but a mangy stray that wanders around. So I thought that was a very interesting answer for her to give. I cannot wait for the next chapters, and I hope you're having a great day. So that made perfect sense to me. And then Kim called. This is Kim Zuckert, who is reading the book for us, and she has a couple of interesting things to say as well. Hi, Heather. It's Kim Zuckert calling. I just listened to uh, the most recent episode 480 of Chapter 5 and 6 of Anne of Green Gables, and um, it's fun. When I'm reading it, I'm thinking, I wonder what it is she's going to define, you know, uh, because it's like I look at it I and I go, well, I know what all this stuff means, and then you define it, and I go, oh, well, I didn't know that about it. So it's always very interesting. I knew you'd define peep of the day. I thought, uh, well, maybe she'll define what a manse is, which you didn't, but pro- probably it came up in a previous book. But I didn't think of anything else. But, uh, you know, it's very interesting. I know what living among the stumps is, but I never thought about it quite as you described it. Very, very interesting. But I have a couple of other opinions of some things that you said. These are not backed up by anything but my brain. They're just what I've always thought, and I could very easily be entirely wrong. And one of them is brought up by hand. Uh, Mrs. Thomas would uh, hold that over Anne's head that she brought her up by hand. To me, I always thought that that meant fed her by hand because uh, she didn't have a mother uh, to, to drink from the breast. And it is more difficult to bring a child up by hand because there was no formula at the time. You know, so if there's no breast milk, and this is obviously post the time of wet nurses, what do you do? It's, you know, I, there's cow's milk, but, you know, that's a bit rich for a little baby. And I think, so to me, that's what I always thought of when she said of uh, bringing her up by hand. And um, you'd find it easier to be bad than good if you had red hair. And you said... <laughs> I don't remember what you said, but what I always thought it meant was that having white hair was such a cross to bear that you just don't have the energy or the attention to work on being good. My God, I have red hair. This is a weight on me, the horror of having red hair. It's so much easier not to also put in the effort to be good. To me, that's what I thought, so... Hey, I got red hair. I, I ain't got I got no time to be good. Uh, and I always thought how very funny it would be for Anne to see how many people, how many women spend so much money and so much time dyeing their hair red as I did for 30 years or longer in this day and age that people want to have red hair. These people are crazy, she would think. They can't even wear pink. <laughs> All right. Anyway, I've been very much enjoying uh, listening to the bits around the chapters that you have been talking about. It's really interesting to hear points of view about book, a book that I know so well. You know, it's just uh, wonderful. And I'm having a swell time reading it. And this week, I will not have a stuffy doze or a hoarse voice that I couldn't get rid of at times. I promise. All right. Bye-bye. Talk to you later. So I thought that was, I thought that was so much fun. Yes. Totally. I can absolutely see what Kim was saying. The bringing up by hand, the feeding by hand thing. Okay, here's a question for one of those things that's like the women's world things are, it's very hard to find sometimes facts and details about all of this. I had assumed that wet nurses, we hear about that in kind of medieval, renaissance feudal society kinds of stories pretty commonly, I had assumed just because of technology that wetness has continued well into the 20th century. I mean, we may have looked all modern and everything, but modern medicine, as far as, especially as far as childbirth, I didn't think that kicked in until much later. Someone listening must be a midwife. Someone has to know the history of this. How long were wet nurses around for? And if you are unfamiliar with the term, The whole process of nursing a baby is, as my mother wisely said to me when I was newly mothering thing one, my first child, she said rather comfortingly to me, nursing may be natural, but that doesn't mean it's easy. There are so many things 
that can be tricky, difficult, or flat out impossible about nursing a baby. All the equipment is there doesn't mean it's going to all work exactly the easy way that a, a sterilized bottle could. So historically, clearly, there have been women who had trouble nursing their babies for many, many, many different reasons. And then there's also the, wow, the mother died in childbirth, and now what do you do? Small infants can't tolerate a whole lot. Although my understanding, and I know I will be corrected if this is wrong, my understanding is that goat and sheep milk can be better tolerated by an infant stomach than cow milk. Okay, so write or call and tell me if I'm totally off on that. But that the idea of having somebody who either recently had an infant and therefore is still producing milk or traumatically recently lost an infant and is therefore still lactating, those lactating women would be of great value in a, a community where you either had a mother who, who, for one reason or another, wasn't able to nurse her baby, or there's a situation where a mother has died in childbirth or shortly thereafter, and there's a baby that needs to be fed. So those women, those lactating women who were feeding children who were not their own biologically would be considered wet nurses. So I kind of assumed that this continued for for a good long while until formula kicked in. I don't know. Someone let us know, because now I'm really curious. All right, chapters eight and nine of Anna Green Gables. There's not a whole lot that needs to be pointed out, except man's going and living at the man's. That was a phrase that was used to describe the home that clergymen might be uh, allowed to live in, or, or once you get the position, that was where you would go and live. It was just another name for it. It wasn't really a mansion. It was just a nice place to live. It wasn't really an estate. It had land that came with it, probably, but it wouldn't have been, you know, Howard's End, is what I'm saying. But it was just a nice, a nice name for the place where clergy would live as, as part of their agreement with that parish or that community that they were serving. Chromo. This is a chromolithograph. We've come across these before, but it was, it's just another way of reproducing a picture, in this case, a painting. And I found a really neat website. It's just somebody's blog where they talk about uh, Victorian stuff. And one of the things that they had an article on was chromolithographs. And they actually own several. And as a consequence, those are reproduced on the website. So if you wanted to see what some of them look like, you can go take a look. The other thing you're going to hear is a reference to the Duchess. The Duchess in Alice in Wonderland. The first time we meet her in chapter nine, she is particularly unpleasant. This is the scene with the screaming baby and the cook and the pepper, and it's just really, really vile and unpleasant. The Duchess, however, has a, a relatively famous line where she says, everything's got a moral, if only you can find it. That is the line that is being referenced in today's chapter. Everything's got a moral, if only you can find it. She, <laughs> she's my least favorite kind of person anywhere in the world, here or fictional, where completely unreasonable, completely hypocritical, and completely invested in moralizing often about their own behavior, rationalizing their own behavior, along with applying morals to everybody else. Like, oh, you mustn't because X. Very much the do what I say, not what I do kind of thing. Oh, and for some reason that made me think Fahrenheit 451. Has anybody else seen the trailers for the upcoming Fahrenheit 451? The guy who played the main antagonist, I won't call him villain because I don't think he was, antagonist in the Black Panther and also Creed in the Apollo Creed, Sylvester Stallone, not really reboot, but sequel for Rocky, the Rocky series. That guy Michael B. Jordan, who is so talented, he's playing Guy Montag in the new Fahrenheit 451. And I cannot wait to see this. It felt, watching the trailer, it felt like finally 
technology caught up with Ray Bradbury and they have made, I'm getting chills thinking about it, they've made what looks like it it might really be a Fahrenheit 451 movie to honor the impact of that story. So if you haven't seen this trailer yet, go onto YouTube and look for it. It's out there, the official trailer. It's, I don't know, a minute or two long. Wow, so excited. I don't know why the, the touches and moralizing made me think of that, but I'm, I'm still very excited. All right, that is really everything I think I need to say before we play the chapters, because I don't want to mess that up for you. So I'll catch you on the flip side. Here we go. Chapters 8 and 9 of Anne of Green Gables. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Read by Kim Zuckert. Chapter 8. Anne's Bringing Up is Begun. For reasons best known to herself, Marilla did not tell Anne that she was to stay at Green Gables until the next afternoon. During the forenoon, she kept the child busy with various tasks and watched over her with a keen eye while she did them. By noon, she had concluded that Anne was smart and obedient, willing to work and quick to learn. Her most serious shortcoming seemed to be a tendency to fall into daydreams in the middle of a task and forget all about it, until such time as she was sharply recalled to earth by a reprimand or a catastrophe. When Anne had finished washing the dinner dishes, she suddenly confronted Marilla with the air and expression of one desperately determined to learn the worst. Her thin little body trembled from head to foot, her face flushed and her eyes dilated until they were almost black. She clasped her hands tightly and said in an imploring voice, "'Oh, please, Miss Cuthbert, won't you tell me if you're going to send me away or not? I've tried to be patient all morning, but I really feel that I cannot bear not knowing any longer. It's a dreadful feeling. Please tell me.' "'You haven't scalded the dishcloth in clean hot water, as I told you to do,' said Marilla, immovably. "'Just go and do it before you ask any more questions, Anne.' Anne went and attended to the dishcloth. Then she returned to Marilla and fastened imploring eyes on the latter's face. "'Well,' said Marilla, unable to find any excuse for deferring her explanation longer, "'I suppose I might as well tell you. Matthew and I have decided to keep you. That is, if you will try to be a good little girl and show yourself grateful.' "'My child, whatever is the matter?' "'I'm crying,' said Anne, in a tone of bewilderment. I can't think why. I'm glad as glad can be. Oh, glad doesn't seem the right word at all. I was glad about the white way and the cherry blossoms, but this... Oh, it's something more than glad. I'm so happy. I'll try to be so good. It will be uphill work, I expect, for Mrs. Thomas often told me I was desperately wicked. However, I'll do my very best. But can you tell me why I'm crying? "'I suppose it's because you're all excited and worked up,' said Marilla disapprovingly. "'Sit down on that chair and try to calm yourself. "'I'm afraid you both cry and laugh far too easily. "'Yes, you can stay here and we will try to do right by you. "'You must go to school, but it's only a fortnight till vacation, "'so it isn't worthwhile for you to start before it opens again in September.' "'What am I to call you?' asked Anne. "'Shall I always say Miss Cuthbert? "'Can I call you Aunt Marilla?' "'No, you'll call me just plain Marilla. "'I'm not used to being called Miss Cuthbert, and it would make me nervous.' "'It sounds awfully disrespectful to just say Marilla,' protested Anne. "'I guess there'll be nothing disrespectful in it if you're careful to speak respectfully. "'Everybody, young and old, in Avonlea calls me Marilla, except the minister. "'He says Miss Cuthbert when he thinks of it.' "'I'd love to call you Aunt Marilla,' said Anne wistfully. "'I've never had an aunt or any relation at all, not even a grandmother. "'It would make me feel as if I really belonged to you. "'Can't I call you Aunt Marilla?' "'No, I'm not your aunt, and I don't believe in calling people names that don't belong to them. "'But we could imagine you were my aunt.' "'I couldn't,' said Marilla, grimly. "'Do you never imagine things different from what they really are?' asked Anne, wide-eyed. "'No.' "'Oh!' Anne drew a long breath. Oh, Miss Marilla, how much you miss. 
I don't believe in imagining things different from what they really are, retorted Marilla. When the Lord puts us in certain circumstances, he doesn't mean for us to imagine them away. And that reminds me, go into the sitting room, Anne, and be sure your feet are clean and don't let any flies in, and bring me out the illustrated card that's on the mantelpiece. The Lord's Prayer is on it, and you'll devote your spare time this afternoon to learning it off by heart. There's to be no more of such praying as I heard last night. I suppose I was very awkward said Anne apologetically. But then you see, I've never had any practice. You couldn't really expect a person to pray very well the first time she tried, could you? I thought out a splendid prayer after I went to bed, just as I promised you I would. It was nearly as long as a minister's. It's so poetical. But would you believe it? I couldn't remember one word when I woke up this morning. And I'm afraid I'll never be able to think out another one as good. Somehow things are never so good when they're thought out a second time. Have you ever noticed that? "'Here's something for you to notice, Anne. "'When I tell you to do a thing, "'I want you to obey me at once "'and not stand stock still and discourse about it. "'Just you go and do as I bid you.' "'Anne promptly departed for the sitting room across the hall. "'She failed to return. "'After waiting ten minutes, "'Marilla laid down her knitting "'and marched after her with a grim expression. "'She found Anne standing motionless "'before a picture hanging on the wall "'between the two windows, "'with her eyes a star with dreams.' The white and green light, strained through apple trees and clustering vines outside, fell over the rapt little figure with a half-unearthly radiance. "'Anne, whatever are you thinking of?' demanded Marilla sharply. Anne came back to earth with a start. "'That,' she said, pointing to the picture, a rather vivid chromo entitled, "'Christ Blessing Little Children.' "'and I was just imagining I was one of them, "'that I was the little girl in the blue dress, "'standing off by herself in the corner "'as if she didn't belong to anybody like me. "'She looks lonely and sad, don't you think? "'I guess she hadn't any father or mother of her own, "'but she wanted to be blessed too, "'so she just crept shyly up on the outside of the crowd, "'hoping nobody would notice her except him. "'I'm sure I know just how she felt.' Her heart must have beat, and her hands must have got cold, like mine did, when I asked you if I could stay. She was afraid he mightn't notice her, but it's likely he did, don't you think? I've been trying to imagine it all out, her edging a little nearer all the time, until she was quite close to him, and then he would look at her, and put his hand on her hair, and oh, such a thrill of joy as would run over her. But I wish the artist hadn't painted him so sorrowful-looking— all his pictures are like that, if you've noticed. But I don't believe he could really have looked so sad, or the children would have been afraid of him. Anne, said Marilla, wondering why she had not broken into the speech long before. You shouldn't talk that way. It's irreverent, positively irreverent. Anne's eyes marveled. Why, well, I felt just as reverent as could be. I'm sure I didn't mean to be irreverent. "'Well, I don't suppose you did, but it doesn't sound right to talk so familiarly about such things. "'And another thing, Anne, when I send you after something, you're to bring it at once "'and not fall into mooning and imagining before pictures. "'Remember that. Take that card and come right to the kitchen. "'Now sit down in the corner and learn that prayer off by heart.' "'Anne set the card up against the jug full of apple blossoms she had brought in to decorate the dinner table.' Marilla had eyed that decoration askance, but it said nothing, propped her chin on her hands, and fell to studying it intently for several silent minutes. "'I like this,' she announced at length. "'It's beautiful. I've heard it before. I heard the superintendent of the Asylum Sunday School say it over once. But I didn't like it then. He had such a cracked voice, and he prayed so mournfully. I really felt sure he thought praying was a disagreeable duty. This isn't poetry, but it makes me feel just the same way poetry does.' Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That is just like a line of music. Oh, I'm so glad you thought of making me learn this, Miss Marilla. We'll learn it and hold your tongue, said Marilla shortly. Anne tipped the vase of apple blossoms near enough to bestow a soft kiss on a pink cupped bud, and then studied diligently for some moments longer. Marilla, she demanded presently, "'Do you think that I shall ever have a bosom friend in Avonlea?' "'A—a uh, what kind of friend?' 
a bosom friend, an intimate friend, you know, a really kindred spirit to whom I can confide my inmost soul. I've dreamed of meeting her all my life. I never really supposed I would, but so many of my loveliest dreams have come true all at once that perhaps this one will too. Do you think it's possible? Diana Barry lives over at Orchard Slope, and she's about your age. She's a very nice little girl, and perhaps she will be a playmate for you when she comes home. She's visiting her aunt over at Carmody just now. You'll have to be careful how you behave yourself, though. Mrs. Barry is a very particular woman. She won't let Diana play with any little girl who is nice and good. Anne looked at Marilla through the apple blossoms, her eyes aglow with interest. What is Diana like? Her hair isn't red, is it? Oh, I hope not. It's bad enough to have red hair myself, but I positively couldn't endure it in a bosom friend. Diana is a very pretty little girl. She has black eyes and hair and rosy cheeks, and she is good and smart, which is better than being pretty. Marilla was as fond of morals as the Duchess in Wonderland, and was firmly convinced that one should be tacked on to every remark made to a child who was being brought up. But Anne waved the moral inconsequently aside and seized only on the delightful possibilities before it. Oh, I'm so glad she's pretty. Next to being beautiful oneself, and that's impossible in my case, it would be best to have a beautiful bosom friend. When I lived with Mrs. Thomas, she had a bookcase in her sitting room with glass doors. There weren't any books in it. Mrs. Thomas kept her best china and her preserves there, when she had any preserves to keep. One of the doors was broken. Mr. Thomas smashed it one night when he was slightly intoxicated. But the other was whole, and I used to pretend that my reflection in it was another little girl who lived in it. I called her Katie Morris, and we were very intimate. I used to talk to her by the hour, especially on Sunday, and tell her everything. Katie was the comfort and consolation of my life. We used to pretend that the bookcase was enchanted, and that if I only knew the spell, I could open the door and step right into the room where Katie Morris lived, instead of into Mrs. Thomas's shelves of preserves and china. And then Katie Morris would have taken me by the hand and led me out into a wonderful place, all flowers and sunshine and fairies, and we would have lived there happy forever after. When I went to live with Mrs. Hammond, it just broke my heart to leave Katie Morris. She felt it dreadfully, too. I know she did, for she was crying when she kissed me goodbye through the bookcase door. There was no bookcase at Mrs. Hammond's. But just up the river, a little way from the house, there was a long, green little valley, and the loveliest echo lived there. It echoed back every word you said, even if you didn't talk a bit loud. So I imagined that it was a little girl called Violetta, and we were great friends, and I loved her almost as well as I loved Katie Morris. Not quite, but almost, you know. The night before I went to the asylum, I said goodbye to Violetta, and oh, her goodbye came back to me in such sad, sad tones. I had become so attached to her that I hadn't the heart to imagine a bosom friend at the asylum, even if there had been any scope for imagination there. I think it's just as well there wasn't, said Marilla dryly. I don't approve of such goings-on. You seem to half believe your own imaginations. It would be well for you to have a real live friend to put such nonsense out of your head. But don't let Mrs. Barry hear you talking about your Katie Morrises and your Violettas, or she'll think you tell stories. Oh, I won't. I wouldn't talk of them to everybody. Their memories are too sacred for that. But I thought I'd like to have you know about them. Oh, look! Here's a big bee just tumbled out of an apple blossom. Just think what a lovely place to live in an apple blossom. Fancy going to sleep in it when the wind was rocking it. If I wasn't a human girl, I think I'd like to be a bee and live among the flowers. Yesterday you wanted to be a seagull, sniffed Marilla. I think you are very fickle-minded. I told you to learn that prayer and not talk, but it seems impossible for you to stop talking if you've got anybody that will listen to you, so go up to your room and learn it. Oh, I know it pretty nearly all now, all but just the last line. Well, never mind, do as I tell you. Go to your room and finish learning it well, and stay there until I call you down to help me get tea. "'Can I take the apple blossoms with me for company?' pleaded Anne. "'No, you don't want your room cluttered up with flowers. "'You should have left them on the tree in the first place.' "'I did feel a little that way, too,' said Anne. "'I kind of felt I shouldn't shorten their lovely lives by picking them. "'I wouldn't want to be picked if I were an apple blossom, "'but the temptation was irresistible. "'What do you do when you meet with an irresistible temptation?' "'Anne, did you hear me tell you to go to your room?' Anne sighed, retreated to the east gable, and sat down in a chair by the window. There, I know this prayer. I learned that last sentence coming upstairs. 
Now I'm going to imagine things into this room so that they'll always stay imagined. The floor is covered with a white velvet carpet with pink roses all over it, and there are pink silk curtains at the windows. The walls are hung with gold and silver brocade tapestry. The furniture is mahogany. I never saw any mahogany, but it does sound so luxurious. And this is a couch, all heaped with gorgeous silken cushions, pink and blue and crimson and gold, and I am reclining gracefully on it. I can see my reflection in that splendid big mirror hanging on the wall. I am tall and regal, clad in a gown of trailing white lace, with a pearl cross on my breast and pearls in my hair. My hair is of midnight darkness, and my skin is a clear ivory pallor. My name is the Lady Cordelia Fitzgerald. No, it isn't. I can't make that seem real. She danced up to the little looking-glass and peered into it. Her pointed, freckled face and solemn gray eyes peered back at her. "'You're only Anne of Green Gables,' she said earnestly. "'And I see you, just as you are looking now, whenever I try to imagine I'm the Lady Cordelia. But it's a million times nicer to be Anne of Green Gables than Anne of Nowhere in particular, isn't it?' She bent forward, kissed her reflection affectionately, and betook herself to the open window. "'Dear Snow Queen, good afternoon, and good afternoon, dear birches down in the hollow, and good afternoon, dear grey house up on the hill. I wonder if Diana is to be my bosom friend. I hope she will, and I shall love her very much, but I must never quite forget Katie Morris and Violetta. They would feel so hurt if I did, and I'd hate to hurt anybody's feelings, even a little bookcase girl's, or a little echo girl's. I must be careful to remember them and send them a kiss every day. Anne blew a couple of airy kisses from her fingertips past the cherry blossoms, and then, with her chin in her hands, drifted luxuriously out on a sea of daydreams. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 Mrs. Rachel Lynde is Properly Horrified Anne had been a fortnight at Green Gables before Mrs. Lynde arrived to inspect her. Mrs. Rachel, to do her justice, was not to blame for this. A severe and unseasonable attack of grip had confined that good lady to her house ever since the occasion of her last visit to Green Gables. Mrs. Rachel was not often sick and had a well-defined contempt for people who were, but grip, she asserted, was like no other illness on earth, and could only be interpreted as one of the special visitations of Providence. As soon as her doctor allowed her to put her foot out of doors, she hurried up to Green Gables, bursting with curiosity to see Matthew and Marilla's orphan, concerning whom all sorts of stories and suppositions had gone abroad in Avonlea. Anne had made good use of every waking moment of that fortnight. Already she was acquainted with every tree and shrub about the place. She had discovered that a lane opened out below the apple orchard and ran up through a belt of woodland, and she had explored it to its furthest end in all its delicious vagaries of brook and bridge, fir coppice and wild cherry arch, corners thick with fern, and branching byways of maple and mountain ash. She had made friends with the spring down in the hollow, that wonderful, deep, clear, icy-cold spring, it was set about with smooth red sandstones and rimmed in by great palm-like clumps of water fern, and beyond it was a log bridge over the brook. That bridge led Anne's dancing feet up over a wooded hill beyond, where perpetual twilight reigned under the straight, thick-growing firs and spruces. The only flowers there were myriads of delicate June bells, those shyest and sweetest of woodland blooms, and a few pale aerial star-flowers, like the spirits of last year's blossoms. Gossamers glimmered like threads of silver among the trees and the fir boughs, and tassels seemed to utter friendly speech. All these raptured voyages of exploration were made in the odd half-hours which she was allowed for play, and Anne talked Matthew and Marilla half-deaf over her discoveries. Not that Matthew complained, to be sure, he listened to all of it with a wordless smile of enjoyment on his face. Marilla permitted the chatter until she found herself becoming too interested in it, whereupon she always promptly quenched Anne by a curt command to hold her tongue. 
Anne was out in the orchard when Mrs. Rachel came, wandering at her own sweet will through the lush, tremulous grasses, splashed with ruddy evening sunshine, so that the good lady had an excellent chance to talk her illness fully over, describing every ache and pulse beat with such evident enjoyment that Marilla thought even grip must bring its compensations. When details were exhausted, Mrs. Rachel introduced the real reason of her call. "'I've been hearing some surprising things about you and Matthew.' "'I don't suppose you are any more surprised than I am myself,' said Marilla. "'I'm getting over my surprise now.' "'It was too bad that was such a mistake,' said Mrs. Rachel, sympathetically. "'Couldn't you have sent her back?' "'I suppose we could, but we decided not to. "'Matthew took a fancy to her, and I must say I like her myself, "'although I admit she has her faults. "'The house seems a different place already. "'She's a real bright little thing.' Marilla said more than she had intended to say when she began, for she read disapproval in Mrs. Rachel's expression. "'It's a great responsibility you've taken on yourself,' said that lady, gloomily, "'especially when you've never had any experience with children. You don't know much about her or her real disposition, I suppose, and there's no guessing how a child like that will turn out. But I don't want to discourage you, I'm sure, Marilla.' "'I'm not feeling discouraged,' was Marilla's dry response. "'When I make up my mind to do a thing, it stays made up. "'I suppose you'd like to see Anne. I'll call her in.' Anne came running in presently, her face sparkling with the delight of her orchard rovings, but, abashed at finding the delight herself in the unexpected presence of a stranger, she halted confusedly inside the door. She certainly was an odd-looking little creature— in the short, tight, wincy dress she had worn from the asylum, below which her thin legs seemed ungracefully long. Her freckles were more numerous and obtrusive than ever. The wind had ruffled her hatless hair into over-brilliant disorder. It had never looked redder than at that moment. "'Well, they didn't pick you for your looks, that's sure and certain,' was Mrs. Rachel Lynde's emphatic comment." Mrs. Rachel was one of those delightful and popular people who pride themselves on speaking their mind without fear or favor. "'She's terribly skinny and homely, Marilla. Come here, child, let me have a look at you. Lawful heart, did anyone ever see such freckles? And hair as red as carrots. Come here, child, I say.' Anne came there, but not exactly as Mrs. Rachel expected. With one bound, she crossed the kitchen floor and stood before Mrs. Rachel, her face scarlet with anger, her lips quivering, and her whole slender form trembling from head to foot. "'I hate you!' she cried in a choked voice, stamping her foot on the floor. "'I hate you! I hate you! I hate you!' A louder stamp with each assertion of hatred. "'How dare you call me skinny and ugly! How dare you say I'm freckled and red-headed! You are a rude, impolite, unfeeling woman!' "'Anne!' exclaimed Marilla in consternation. But Anne continued to face Mrs. Rachel undauntedly, head up, eyes blazing, hands clenched, passionate indignation exhaling from her like an atmosphere. "'How dare you say such things about me?' she repeated vehemently. "'How would you like to have such things said about you? How would you like to be told that you're fat and clumsy and probably hadn't a spark of imagination in you?' I don't care if I do hurt your feelings by saying so. I hope I hurt them. You have hurt mine worse than they were ever hurt before, even by Mrs. Thomas's intoxicated husband, and I'll never forgive you for it. Never, never. Stamp, stamp. Did anybody ever see such a temper? exclaimed the horrified Mrs. Rachel. Anne, go up to your room and stay there until I come up said Marilla, recovering her powers of speech with difficulty. Anne, bursting into tears, rushed to the hall door, slammed it until the tins on the porch wall outside rattled in sympathy, and fled through the hall and up the stairs like a whirlwind. A subdued slam above told that the door of the east gable had been shut with equal vehemence. Well, I don't envy you your job bringing that up. Marilla, said Mrs. Rachel, with unspeakable solemnity. Marilla opened her lips to say she knew not what of apology or deprecation. What she did say was a surprise to herself then and ever afterwards. You shouldn't have twitted her about her looks, Rachel. Marilla Cuthbert! "'You don't mean to say you are upholding her "'in such a terrible display of temper as we've just seen,' 
demanded Mrs. Rachel indignantly. No, said Marilla slowly. I'm not trying to excuse her. She's been very naughty, and I'll have to give her a talking to about it. But we must make allowances for her. She's never been taught what is right. And you were too hard on her, Rachel. Marilla could not help tacking on that last sentence, although she was again surprised at herself for doing it. Mrs. Rachel got up with an air of offended dignity. "'Well, I see that I'll have to be very careful what I say after this, Marilla, since the fine feelings of orphans, brought from goodness knows where, have to be considered before anything else. Oh, no, I'm not vexed. Don't worry yourself. I'm too sorry for you to leave any room for anger in my mind. You'll have your own troubles with that child, but if you'll take my advice, which I suppose you won't do, although I've brought up ten children and buried two, you'll do that talking to you mention with a fair-sized birch switch. I should think that would be the most effective language for that kind of a child. Her temper matches her hair, I guess. Well, good evening, Marilla. I hope you'll come down to see me often, as usual, but you can't expect me to visit here again in a hurry if I'm liable to be flown at and insulted in such a fashion. It's something new in my experience. Whereat Mrs. Rachel swept out and away, if a fat woman who always waddled could be said to sweep away, and Marilla, with a very solemn face, betook herself to the East Gable. On the way upstairs she pondered uneasily as to what she ought to do. She felt no little dismay over the scene that had just been enacted. How unfortunate that Anne should have displayed such temper before Mrs. Rachel Lynde, of all people! Then Marilla suddenly became aware of an uncomfortable and rebuking consciousness, that she felt more humiliation over this than sorrow over the discovery of such a serious defect in Anne's disposition. And how was she to punish her? The amiable suggestion of the birch switch, to the efficiency of which all of Mrs. Rachel's own children could have borne smarting testimony, did not appeal to Marilla. She did not believe she could whip a child. No, some other method of punishment must be found to bring Anne to a proper realization of the enormity of her offense. Marilla found Anne face downward on her bed, crying bitterly, quite oblivious of muddy boots on a clean counterpane. Anne, she said, not ungently. No answer. Anne, with greater severity, get off that bed this minute and listen to what I have to say to you. Anne squirmed off the bed and sat rigidly on a chair beside it, her face swollen and tear-stained, and her eyes fixed stubbornly on the floor. This is a nice way for you to behave. Anne, aren't you ashamed of yourself? She hadn't any right to call me ugly and red-headed, retorted Anne, evasive and defiant. You hadn't any right to fly into such a fury and talk the way you did to her, Anne. I was ashamed of you, thoroughly ashamed of you. I wanted you to behave nicely to Mrs. Lynde, and instead of that, you have disgraced me. I'm sure I don't know why you should lose your temper like that, just because Mrs. Lynde said you were red-haired and homely. You say it yourself often enough. Oh, but there's such a difference between saying a thing yourself and hearing other people say it, wailed Anne. You may know a thing is so, but you can't help hoping other people don't quite think it is. I suppose you think I have an awful temper, but I couldn't help it. When she said those things, something just rose right up in me and choked me. I had to fly out at her. Well, you made a fine exhibition of yourself, I must say. Mrs. Lynde will have a nice story to tell about you everywhere, and she'll tell it, too. It was a dreadful thing for you to lose your temper like that, Anne. Just imagine how you would feel if somebody told you to your face that you were skinny and ugly, pleaded Anne, tearfully. An old remembrance suddenly rose up before Marilla. She had been a very small child when she had heard one aunt say of her to another, What a pity she is such a dark, homely little thing. Marilla was every day of fifty before the sting had gone out of that memory. I don't say that I think Mrs. Lynde was exactly right in saying what she did to you, Anne, she admitted in a softer tone. Rachel is too outspoken. 
but that is no excuse for such behavior on your part. She was a stranger and an elderly person and my visitor, all three very good reasons why you should have been respectful to her. You were rude and saucy, and Marilla had a saving inspiration of punishment. You must go to her and tell her you are very sorry for your bad temper and ask her to forgive you. I can never do that said Anne determinedly and darkly. You can punish me in any way you like, Marilla. You can shut me up in a dark, damp dungeon inhabited by snakes and toads and feed me only on bread and water, and I shall not complain. But I cannot ask Mrs. Lynde to forgive me. We're not in the habit of shutting people up in dark, damp dungeons, said Marilla dryly, especially as they're rather scarce in Avonlea. But apologize to Mrs. Lynde you must and shall, and you'll stay here in your room until you can tell me you're willing to do it. I shall have to stay here forever, then, said Anne mournfully, because I can't tell Mrs. Lynde I'm sorry I said those things to her. How can I? I'm not sorry. I'm sorry I vexed you, but I'm glad I told her just what I did. It was a great satisfaction. I can't say I'm sorry when I'm not, can I? I can't even imagine I'm sorry. Perhaps your imagination will be in better working order by the morning, said Marilla, rising to depart. You'll have the night to think over your conduct and come to a better frame of mind. You said you would try to be a very good girl if we kept you at Green Gables, but I must say it hasn't seemed very much like it this evening. Leaving this Parthian shaft to rankle in Anne's stormy bosom, Marilla descended to the kitchen, grievously troubled in mind and vexed in soul. She was as angry with herself as with Anne, because whenever she recalled Mrs. Rachel's dumbfounded countenance, her lips twitched with amusement, and she felt a most reprehensible desire to laugh. End of chapter 9 <laughs> All right. So, had a little fireworks today, but before we had the fireworks, Anne mentioned blue dresses. Keep your ears open for blue dresses. They get mentioned over and over again. Now, I told you way back when we were first discussing Lucy Maud Montgomery that there was a moment in early chapters where I felt like you could really palpably get the kind of emotional abuse, if not physical, but definitely emotional abuse that Anne survived. And I have to say, survived with her goodness intact, which I think is nigh on miraculous at this point. Chapter eight is the one that made me weep. And if it didn't make you weep, go back and listen to it when you're not vacuuming or doing the dishes or, you know, doing, doing anything that might distract you. Zentangling, sure. You can listen. You will probably, however, get tear stains on your Zentangle. I'm just letting you know. The explanation that Anne gives for how she kept herself friended while she was living in these distant and really pretty horrible conditions. The one that broke my heart was when she talked about her friend Katie Maurice. Katie who was the girl in the reflection in the bookcase at the Thomases. One glass pane of which this bookcase had been broken by Mr. Thomas when he was drunk. Okay, so already, yikes. But the idea that the only girl Anne had to talk to was Katie Maurice, Anne's reflection, is bad enough. But when she knew she had to leave, and Katie Maurice wouldn't stop crying, and you know that's Anne, and that no matter how many times she kissed her, she couldn't get her to stop. To me, that is about as heartbreaking as any lifetime movie of the week designed to tug at your heartstrings. And the thing that worries me when I read that is that lifetime movies of the week kinds of things are designed specifically to make you feel like that at the end of the episode or the end of the, the movie. This is the beginning of the story, and it's in the middle of a chapter. This doesn't feel like Lucy Maud Montgomery necessarily trying to, as, as my mom might have said, Steven Spielberg, your emotions. This is not E.T. designed to make you cry. This is just a story. 
I don't even know if Lucy Maud Montgomery noticed what she had written and that it was that heartbreaking because I have a sneaking suspicion that some version of this was part of her childhood. I think it is very possible that to her this was just a story. Because the next one, somehow slightly less heartbreaking, is her having a friend in an echo, which I get. And any kid who has played outdoors by themselves in any kind of a a natural environment has probably had some sort of playtime where you're interacting with the natural world. But the mirror, the girl in the mirror, in the, the reflection on the glass, killed me. But Anne bounces back. I mean, that's what she does. That is the way she rolls. And and we see that <laughs> so beautifully done in chapter nine, because I love that the worst thing you can be or or lack is imagination. A lack of imagination is clearly in Anne's book the single worst character flaw a human could have. And now I get why. So many of my friends loved these books because those girls were the ones who had the great imaginations. And those boys were too. I have met several boys of late who read this book when they were young and love this book. They're not particularly old right now. They're 13, 14, 15 years old, but loved it. And I think that's why. I also think that the whole your temper matches your hair thing is kind of fun, especially after Kim's comment earlier. But also, I think it's very important to notice that Marilla, who, you know, feels like she should be the moralizing duchess in this one, Marilla does something unique as well. And that is, she lets Anne talk. This is extraordinary, I think. She, she lets Anne talk. So many adults in a situation like this would be zip, 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 zip. I don't, I don't want to hear it. Me, me. She, she lets Anne explain what was going on. Is it because she knows somehow that Anne is right? I don't know. But she lets Anne talk. And I love that. I love that about Marilla. I have a couple more things for you. Uh, one is that there were some missing notes in the audio for links that were in the show notes last week. And one of them, I just, I just didn't get the name in time to record it. The first link is Anne had a line where she said that uh, the really horrible woman looked like a gimlet. And a gimlet is a boring tool that has an eye. There's a picture of it on the show notes for last week. And I put it on for this week again, craftlet.com slash 481 or 480 for last week. It is a mean thing to call someone. And yet... It is a very descriptive way to identify someone's personality. So go take a look at that picture. Also, the Presbyterian Shorter Catechism, I have a link to, and you'll hear more on that in a moment. And I have the link to the article on the New England Primer and the difference between the one that was compiled in 1683 and the one that you can find on Amazon, uh, mostly as a Kindle, from 1777. Very, very different books. I mean, that's a, an important hundred years there difference. And my son's friend, who I said was descended from a, a woman who wrote a captivity narrative, Penelope Stout. I have linked out to her story. It is extraordinary. I mean, really extraordinary. Like, she was partially eviscerated and left for dead and crawled her way to safety and was rescued by a Native American tribe. And then, I mean, it just never ends. She lived until she was 100. After, after all of that, uh, she lived until she was either 100 or close to 100 and had hundreds of descendants because she had so many children by the time she was done with all of that. Woof. So if you're looking for an inspiring story along with the Anne story, Penelope Stout. Follow the link at craftlit.com slash 481. But the last two things I have for you is an email from Melissa. This is Melissa, who is Peace Weaver on Ravelry and who runs the traditional hand weaving site, Peace Weavers. Kind of makes sense. She wrote in about a comment from a while ago, actually. And then after her email, I'm going to play Renee's audio. Renee, our resident Presbyterian minister, 
she sent me an email and then I asked her to record it because it's so much better to hear it in her voice. And I think it gives us a lot of really useful information, not just on the book itself, but also helps to put Lucy Maud Montgomery's religious upbringing in context too. And I will let Renee play us out. All right, here is the email from Melissa, and then we'll go straight into Renee. Melissa said, Hi, I've been catching up on the show while homesick with the flu. I'm so sorry. I'm delighted with both Anne of Green Gables and A Room with a View. I've read both books at least once, and they are longtime favorites that I'm going to enjoy revisiting and enjoy even more with your annotations. Yay! You mentioned French boys in the early chapters of Anne of Green Gables and referred to the proximity of Quebec. I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Acadians, who were some of the first European settlers in what is now Canada, arriving in the early 1600s from the province of Poitou in France. What was called Acadia included present-day Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and parts of mainland Quebec and New Brunswick. The French and English fought over this territory for decades, and in 1755, the British took possession and expelled all the Acadians. This is called the Grand Derangement. Some returned to France, some took to the hills and hid, and many died of privation. Most were divided into groups and shipped to the American colonies where they were rarely received well. They were jailed, placed in servitude, sent to England to be imprisoned there. Some made it to the French Caribbean islands. Those who went to Maryland, a Catholic state, were better received and protected by French landowners. For nearly 10 years, they wandered until Louisiana allowed many to come and settle up in the bayous, land no one else wanted. These people are now known as Cajuns, and they have preserved their language and culture to an amazing extent. The Acadians were allowed to return to Nova Scotia after 1763, but could not settle in large groups and had already, of course, lost their farms to New England planters and were later displaced by loyalists fleeing after the American Revolution. Today, as in Anne's time, there are many Acadian people living throughout the Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island area, as well as New Brunswick. So, there would have been French boys, in quotation marks, living on Prince Edward Island and having large families, there would be boys for hire. There are distinct cultural differences between the Acadians and the Quebecois. They come from different parts of France, which had many distinct cultural groups in the 1600s and 1700s. Actually, I learned recently that the French language was not standardized until the early 1900s. Sorry this is so long, it's a complex story. I teach a class about Acadian weaving called Le Mort de Maman, the French phrase for the girl's dowry, a mother's love. Part of what is exciting about this class is how much of the Canadian Acadian weaving heritage was still alive in Louisiana. 250 years later. There is a great little film called Canton Jean that touches on this, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes. I've enjoyed learning about the Acadian history in Canada and Louisiana so that I can share it with my students. I can't thank you enough for how much Craftlet enhances my life and my brain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Love, Melissa. P.S. I clearly missed something. Why did you have to move again? My condolences. Yes, I know, I realized. This all happened during my downtime. It fell into our lap. We found a place that had, this sounds really kind of trite, but it's not. We have three people with asthma and varying levels of lung issues. And we've been living in a house without central air, which means without any kind of filtration system. And while I love to have the windows open, and we can often, there are times when we simply have to have the air circulating through a filter. And it was getting bad for a thing, too. So we found a place. It was a little bit bigger. It was closer to town. It was better for the kids. And it was especially health-wise a lot better. So that's why we moved. All right. Links to what Melissa talked about are in the show notes. And here is Renee. Hey, Heather. This is Renee Rico. And I'm sending you this email because I wanted you to know a little bit about some of the Presbyterian history that you were talking about in Anne of Green Gables in the last couple of episodes. First, let's talk about the Presbyterian Charter Catechism. I'm assuming that most folks won't know what it is or where it came from. Uh, Back during the English Reformation, think Roundheads and Oliver Cromwell, there was a movement to create a statement of Protestant faith that would unite all of the British Isles. And this became known eventually as the Westminster Confession of Faith, which was only adopted by the Church of Scotland, not England, and that's a side trip I'll skip. For almost 400 years in the Presbyterian tradition, 
this was the confession of faith used uh, in what I would call the Reformed tradition. That would be Presbyterians, the Reformed Church, the Congregationalists. And it's from this Westminster Confession that there are two catechisms created, the shorter and the longer, which took the confession and they put it into a question and answer format. These were to be used to teach the faith and to memorize. And so for generations, memorizing one of the catechisms was necessarily to become confirmed in the church as a member. Now, by the time I joined the church in uh, the 1980s, this had been long abandoned. But in seminary, there was a vestige of this. One could compete for a financial scholarship prize by writing out the answers to the Shorter Catechism. So for Anne to have begun memorizing the Shorter Catechism in the Asylum Sunday School seems right on target. That catechism has over 100 question and answers. So I totally cracked up that Marilla thinks that Anne is a heathen when she has already begun memorizing this at age 11. Another thing, um, Lucy Montgomery's husband sounds like a very conservative Presbyterian marred by a mental illness. When Calvin creates this theological notion of the elect, he's trying to get away from the Roman Catholic understanding that you had to earn your way into salvation. So instead, people affirmed their faith, and then they were by their work showing the evidence of that faith that God had and grace that they had already received. Calvin meant for folks to know that if they had, been, they had accepted Jesus as their Savior and were working on their faith despite imperfections, that they were what was called the elect. They were headed for heaven. And so it's such a tragedy to me at how this was twisted Uh, We saw this before when you uh, did the Scarlet Letter into a dark and tormented religious idea. I also want to talk a little bit about nature and Protestantism. It's a decidedly mixed bag. Calvin saw the book of nature as part of God's revelation to us, and yet the notion of the wilderness as the place where we meet God was never really emphasized in the Protestant faith even though wild places are constantly used as the meeting place with God in both the Hebrew Bible, think Moses and Elijah, and in the Christian tradition, Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. There were desert fathers and mothers of the Christian faith. The ironies of great location of beauty being avoided by Presbyterians was symbolized also at my seminary. It had a view of a majestic mountain, Mount Tamalpais in Marin County, north of San Francisco. Now, there was a chapel at the top of the hill of this seminary, and it only had stained glass windows, so there was no view from the chapel to probably one of the most beautiful sites uh, in the county. I also wanted to talk about uh, the touching insight that Marilla has about Anne's faith. Uh, She notes that she believes that Anne's faith and understanding of God is somewhat distorted because Anne has never had the model of human love modeled for her, so she's unable to really understand what God's love is. That's just a touching insight, and I I thought it was a really observant one. So, Heather, uh, glad to offer these insights. I hope they're helpful. Looking forward to the next chapters. Thanks. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.